All right, guys. I told you last time that I would share with you anything else that came to me. And sure enough, I, I have not opened it all the way. I opened it, I saw something cool, and I was like, okay, gotta pull out the cameras. All right. So it is a box, um, a crate. I suppose a crate is the right word. And I think that's pretty cool because I don't think I've ever actually gotten a crate before. Even some of my more rare pieces. Oh, did not come like this. All right. All right, whoa. All right. Ah, all right, all right. So what do we see here? Property of Tennyson Neely, London, New York, Chicago. Property of, all right, box. Got a note on the front, 114 Fifth Avenue, New York City, New York. All right, we've got an interesting stamp on the top for Tennyson Neely, publisher. All right. Let's carefully open. All right, let's see. All right, all right. All right, I want to I want to try to open it without damaging the wood too much. But looks like it's not going to uh, play too nicely. That's fine. That's fine. All right. That's one side. All right. Okay. What you want to see when you open a strange boxes is a little bit of <laughs> strange um, powder lying up. All right. All right. Come on. Well, let's just take them one by one. All right, what do we have here? We have a picture of, looks like it could be a building from New York City. All right, a postcard. Uh, it's a 
looked kind of like a ribbon cutting ceremony. A um, bunch of kids, so maybe a school. That's what I kind of kind of imagine. Ribbon cutting, Washington Square, New York City, opening the first government sponsored lethal chamber. Why are there a bunch of kids there? All right. America's weird sometimes, people. Chaos at the Royal Strand Theater. I told people, do not go to where the king in yellow is being played, right? Didn't I say that? All right. Weeks have been spent attempting to breach the veil of secrecy surrounding the strange performance set to interrupt the run of Fanny currently being shown at the Royal Strand Theater to mixed reviews. This correspondent had been frustrated in every attempt. No advance tickets were being sold, nor was there any information given by the theater. In fact, after several interviews with managers of the theater, it is the opinion of this correspondent that the theater itself is unaware of the details of the production, referring only to an obscure contract reserving the theater for a single night for a production of a new play called The King in Yellow. This is 1895, by the way. So, obviously, it's too late for them. They should have, should have gone into a time machine and watched this video last, last time. So, all right. Yesterday evening, this correspondent attempted to attend the performance. Given the lack of advanced tickets, it was assumed that a long queue would have formed. This was not the case. Several cabs as well as personal carriages of, of obvious affluence were observed pulling up to the theater and their fashionably dressed occupants, all wearing masks, entered the theater without showing any tickets at all. When this correspondent reached the doors, his entry was barred by a large doorman of Indian descent who made it clear that the performance was for invited guests only. The performance went on for an hour and a half. Hoping for an interview or two with the attendees after the play, this correspondent waited outside for the play to finish. What occurred next was as unexpected as it was horrifying. Patrons ran from the building, laughing and crying, yelling what seemed to be obscenities, although they were not in any recognizable language. What was worse was the state of their garments. Hems, which on entrance had been the height of elegance and fine tailoring, were torn to tatters. Gowns ripped to threads, tailcoats in shreds. They came from the theater in small groups, and despite every effort to engage in conversation, they ignored all except each other. Looks of madness were seen in their eyes as they clambered into waiting conveyances of various kinds or simply ran off into the night. This inexplicable behavior has left all who witnessed it baffled. Upon return to the theater the following day, all references to the play had disappeared, and none would make mention of it or comment on the events of the previous evening. When Scotland Yard was informed of the evening in question, they did not promise to investigate, but no evi- they did promise to investigate, did, but no evidence of such has been forthcoming. This correspondent has no explanation for what he witnessed, but will continue to seek out answers for this publication. All right. Madness, people. Madness. The dogs are going crazy. All right. Madness beneath the royal strand. <clears throat> this is a long one, guys. This correspondent, not satisfied with the lack of information obtainable from the owners of the Royal Strand Theater and concerned at the lack of proper investigation by Scotland Yard, chose to venture into the theater itself in search of answers. The deserted streets of Westminster were still wet from the rain earlier in the evening, and the flickering light lamplight made the theater seem otherworldly. Approached with caution, the ingress was found a simple task. The stage entrance door had not been barred for the night, and so it was possible to slip inside. A candle stub was lit, and this correspondent was able to observe the surrounding dark hallway. Pacing quietly down the hall, this correspondent looked into doorways as they passed. The flickering candle gave the masks and costumes found within these rooms a strange kind of life, 
as hollow eyes peered back, their contents sunken into deep shadow. Ancient swords glinted with a reddish hue, and strange powders floated in the air, their chalky scent wafting into the hallway. I found a stairwell that led deeper beneath the theater. The atmosphere grew colder as I descended and a scent of damp earth filled the air, sending chills along my skin despite my long sleeves and waistcoat. I lit a second candle with some regret, knowing it to be my last. I had not anticipated this adventure lasting quite this long. The first landing I came to led to nothing more than a large room filled with ancient stage furniture and grand painting backdrops, with mold beginning its slow and inexorable invasion in the corners. I went down further and began to hear a noise rising from below. At first, the echoes and distortion of the stairwell made it impossible to identify. But as I reached the bottom of the stair, it became clear that the sound was the ululating laughter of a madman, clearly radiating through the large iron door that stood before me. I tried my best to open the door without making a sound. The ensuing shriek of rusted hinges caused me to freeze in my tracks, but no change came to the high-pitched laughter that continued from the slowly opening doorway. Once I pulled back the door to its fullest extent, I had to grip the rusty handle to keep myself from fainting dead away at the sight which greeted me. The laughter had abruptly died to distant echoes and then to silence. The room was briefly lit with candles melted down into large beehive-shaped mounds of wax scattered at random intervals around the floor. The walls were covered in their entirety by the scrawling of a child, Phrases such as the tattered robes of the stranger, the yellow king, and distant carcosa were repeated over and over at various angles and sizes. Yellow suns drawn away always in pairs could be seen about. Most of all, a strange hieroglyphic could be seen in every corner of the room. Every space that had no writing contained the sigil. I drew it in my notebook from memory once I quitted that awful place. This was the same as the amulet that was sent to me a couple weeks ago. Stranger still was the floor of the chamber. Apart from a small circle in the center of the room and a narrow walkway to the entrance in which I stood, the floor was filled completely. The same small statue about a foot tall of a man dressed in tattered robes, a crown upon his head, his face covered by a shroud or hood, had been carved and placed on the floor. It had been carved again and again, always the same. Hundreds of the statues stood. Every square inch of floor not taken by candles contained one of these strange figures. I felt their gaze upon me as I stood dumbfounded in the doorway. I felt unnerved to the core. It took me several moments to master myself. Instilling my resolve, I entered the room. I trod carefully down the narrow walkway amongst the statues and reached the center of the room. There, on the floor in a narrow circle, just large enough for a man to sit, was a note. Scrawled in the same hand as that which marked the walls, it read, My work is done, and my yellow lord has freed me from my travails. I am free now to seek out oblivion. I shall travel overseas to the government lethal chamber to seek peace from the voices that haunt me. The lethal chamber again. I exited the building with all haste for fear that whatever madness haunted that hall should affect me as well. I gave my report to the yard as well as my newspaper. I do not know what has happened since. I shall take a leave of absence and go abroad. I have been so shaken by what I saw that I need to escape. I heard some philanthropists connected with the museum had acquired the statuary. For what purpose, I cannot say. This will be my final column with this publication. I have seen things. Okay. All right. So the 
newspaper clippings was from a correspondent named Joshua Prevert. And this letter is written to the same man. My dear Joshua Prevert, my contacts at your inestimable newspaper informed me of your articles, which thankful were never allowed to be published. It is of the first importance that our activities remain obscured from the public eye. From what I understand, you are no longer in any state to reveal any secrets you may have stumbled across, and the Sussex Lunatic Asylum does not allow its inmates any outgoing correspondence. I, I cannot accept even that remote risk, however. I am writing you to inform that I have acquired the artifacts and documents you claim to have dis discovered under the Strand. I have been instructed by the servants that your articles, even if unpublished, pose a threat to our order. I will concoct insolvency so that I may fall from the public spotlight. The better to keep these artifacts safe until they are needed. I tell you this so that you understand the futility of any further attempts to discuss or expound upon this matter. When the time for the statues is right, the world must never suspect. We will ensure that you live out the rest of your days in your cell, Mr. Prevert. The servants will ensure that you come to no harm. Your madness belies your report, and that is of, a, of paramount importance. Know that the secrets you uncovered merely scratch the surface of our plans. Fare thee well, Mr. Prevert. F. Tennyson Neely. Patient delivery approved. What kind of asylum approves this letter? This, this, this is not a good letter, people. Um, Tennyson Neely. Same as the stamps on the on the box. Whoa. I uh I actually feel like the statue's heavier than the box. It doesn't make any sense, right? So A man with heavy cloaks, a flame-like crown, uh, it's not showing his face, and um, you want to hope that the spikes are meant to represent some sort of shoulder guard and not some sort of bony extrusion, right? That is a uh, small, small detail. Looks like tentacles coming out from underneath the robe uh, in the back. So, what can go wrong, people? Mysterious statue from, from uh, wherever it came from, from unknown sources. So um, all I can do is wait until um, if another package comes. Um, is that good or bad for the world if another package comes? I don't know. Um, let's, uh, well. Who do you think it is? Who do you think it is? Who do I think it is? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I would think that um, because of all the references to the king in yellow, that it's meant to be the king in yellow, Hester, the, um, um, you know, the, the, that faction of, of the ancient ones. So, um, yeah, super cool.
Very, very cool. The, uh, the robes really do a good job of, of being tattered, right? It's, it's statuary, it's stone. So, um, the, the tatterness of like the linens you can kind of imagine. So that is, uh, that is really cool. And with that, guys, um, until next time, assuming that some ancient one doesn't open up, wake up and end the world. So, um, yeah, that's it. I don't have anything else to say, guys. Like, there's just some cool stuff going on. And, uh, yeah. Bye, guys.